Hello Nandini Das. It's a very dreary and chilly day here in London, but I'm hoping that you're going to brighten up my morning with a little trip back to India. Well, warm welcome to Travels Through Time. We're going to spend the next hour or so discussing uh, the story you tell in this fascinating book, which I have right next to me here. It's a great achievement. Congratulations. Um, but before we talk about courting India, could we talk just a little bit about you first so you can introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your academic background, so it's very interesting, and also about your research interests, please. Thank you, Peter. And it's so good to be able to do this, particularly on such a dreary day. Um, <laughs> it know. is as grey in Oxford as it must be in London. Um, mm. So my academic background is in English literature. I work on the 16th and 17th centuries, and I started off looking at what in that period was the go-to form of popular entertainment, the romance, chivalric romances. You know, all the stuff about Arthur and Merlin and knights and ladies, gentle deeds, that kind of stuff. But as I started working on that, you soon realized that apart from the fighting and meeting beautiful ladies, the other thing that knights tend to do a lot is wander around. They travel a lot. And sometimes the traveling, the wandering takes precedence about overdoing anything else, actually. Um, so I started getting interested in writing about travel and particularly, and perhaps this has something to do with my own personal background, about the role that memory plays, either cultural memory, so memory that you share with a community or with a particular culture, or individual memory plays when you encounter a new place. Um, as an international scholar, for instance, when I first came to England as an undergraduate from India, your listeners will know this from their own travels. That moment of weird bifocal vision you have when you go to a place that you've seen or read about before, and you're there physically in that place, part of you is seeing it through the eyes of the lens in a film, perhaps, or through the words on the page of the book you've read about that particular place. And the other part is experiencing it for firsthand. So that was what interested me. That's a really great phrase, uh, kind of bifocal um, perception. And I know this thing when you step off a ship or an aeroplane and you're in a, a completely um, new place, just how you struggle to find points of references. And it can be so overpowering and so exciting. And um, I think you did capture a lot of that. And the person we're going to talk about particularly who has this experience is the protagonist in your in your book, Thomas Rowe. And um, could you tell us a little bit about who Rowe is and why he fascinated you quite so much? Well, Thomas Rowe is the first English ambassador sent to India. And we are talking about 14 years after the East India Company had been established by Elizabeth I. Um, the East India Company just managed to get its royal permit while in the very last kind of um, moments of the Elizabethan regime, essentially. And then James I comes to the throne. Um, the merchants have been petitioning by this point for about 10, 14 years that England really needs to send a diplomatic re representative to the Mughal state, the Mughal empire in India in order to get the trading permits, without which you can't really do business, international trade. And the man they pick, in fact, both sides pick, both the king and the trading companies agree, is going to be the best fit for the job, is um, young Thomas Rowe in his mid-30s, a man on the make, bright, courtly enough to be able to do an impressive flourish of the hat, but also practical enough to know his way around merchants and sailors. He had something to prove as well, didn't he? Because he'd had a disaster prior to his embassy. Is that right? Yes, it is. I mean, he had something to prove on multiple levels. Um, he had a disaster because he had been sent to Guyana in South America and he sank a lot of his money. In fact, um, from the court records that we see in this period, it seems like he pretty much sold off most of his estate and he didn't have much to begin with anyway. 
um, in in order to fund this exploration into Guyana and then, you know, taking boats up the River Amazon. Um, and this was part of a long running in English saga. So Walter Raleigh, when he goes to South America, comes back and says, everyone in South America talks about El Dorado. And El Dorado is not a place, it's a human being, the king of this place where gold is so plentiful that their king just rolls around in gold and becomes the man of gold. So obviously, England is pretty cash strapped after the Armada. They've been sinking a lot of money in military defenses. And then, you know, to all that talk of gold obviously interests everyone. So Roe is one in the line of many who go in search of all of this, doesn't find El Dorado, loses his estate and comes back. And then to complicate matters even further, he falls in love and marries a woman without her mother's permission, which is not a good thing to do if you're already struggling financially and you can't even reach out for a handout from your in-laws. So he is pretty desperate to kind of make his fortune and make his name. It's, it, all this adds, doesn't it, to, I suppose, a sense of emotional intensity, which is there right at the beginning of the embassy. And I wanted to ask you a question about the idea of the ambassador. It's something you write about early on in the book. And... Um, I think it's something that bears talking about a little bit because I always remember that wonderful quote from Sir Henry Wotton when he says, an ambassador is a good, honest man sent abroad to lie in the interests of his country. And um, it's the kind of one that still comes out on the um, after dinner speeches circuit today, you hear it. Um, and I think that was from around this time, maybe a decade or so earlier. And it made me wonder how formalised the idea of an ambassador was at that time or how was it something that was quite quite new and exciting because obviously when you have more movement around the world you have to send people to act on behalf of the monarch they have to be that person in a different place say maybe before 1492 this might not have been quite so necessary but in a globalizing world it becomes something that's important is that right i, I think you're absolutely right um to put the emphasis on the global in this period and that is exactly what shifts the focus i think in terms of diplomatic negotiations. So if you think about um, till around early 1600s even, relationships between European states or um, even the kind of wider um, European kind of states and some of their familiar counterparts in non-European regions could quite easily take place through envoys or royal messengers. So if you needed to send a message, you'd send a royal envoy who would go, stay for a very brief period of time, and then return. But as statecraft itself started getting more complicated, as it started getting involved in matters of trade and economy much more, you know, much more inherently in some ways, the role of the ambassador became really important. Um, there were certain resident ambassadors always in England. So you, um, all through the whole agonizing period of Henry VIII, deciding whether, you know, heads would remain on shoulders or not among his wife of the month, um, you had resident ambassadors at the English court writing back worrying le letters to Europe. Um, but... The key thing in this period is sending resident ambassadors to those huge, and by that I really mean huge global superpowers, which are not European. You have the Mughals, the Ottomans, and the Safavids capturing most of the Red Sea, Mediterranean um, trade routes. And then you have the Qing dynasty in China on the other side. The Portuguese and the Dutch are kind of controlling some of the South American and American kind of trade routes um, coming from Mexico, for instance. But you do need people, your man on the ground, who will be your reflection as a ruler, as a sovereign. And that's where the ambassador's role becomes really important. You're not just so, being a diplomat. 
Yeah, so he we have to think of Roe as having been approved of by James, the king. And um, let me move on to the next thing I want to ask about. We'll do this from the other side in a moment. But first of all, because it's something which is absolutely central to the book and something you write about, um, again, in the early portions, is the idea of India in the English imagination. And... Um, Obviously, the early 17th century, late 16th century, such a wonderful period for literature when you have Shakespeare and Marlowe and all these great playwrights and um, more experimentations in form as well. Where does India appear in that kind of cultural expression of the English at the time? Well, I think there's a fairly major collector of travel accounts who writes in the 17th century, William Purchase, who puts it really well by saying, India is pretty much everything that we want it to be um, in that part of the world. And that is quite interesting because India doesn't really signify a specific geographical region. There's a rough idea of the South Asian subcontinent, but India becomes a fairly malleable term, which can signify anything from kind of that, um, you know, beyond the Ottoman Empire, essentially, within the Asian Middle Eastern region. But then, of course, thanks to Christopher Columbus, it starts sneakily spreading on the other side of the world. Um, and that becomes partly the, a, a problem for English travelers and English readers. When your text re refers to meeting an Indian, you never know whether you're in Asia or in North America. Mm. That's that's really a feature of travel writing, isn't it? Which stretches on. I know um, I was reading an account of um, travellers in Tahiti, and uh, you know this is late eighteenth century, and they talk about here in America where we are. It's <laughs> so approximate. It will <laughs> do. <to> be quite <laughs> exactly um, because that's where they more or less are. Um, so let's turn this on its head as well, though, a little bit because I want to look at both sides of this equation. So. If India is this kind of, they have this idea of being a treasure trove of, of things and what they aspire to be, but without any sense of accuracy. England, for people in the Mughal Empire, for example, what, what, what do they think? I mean, are we doing a good impression today of what they thought it was back then? A foggy, damp island on the rim of Europe, which has very little consequence to them. Is that what it was? Well, here's the thing. England doesn't really appear in any of the Mughal records at all. And that's quite telling, I think. There are fleeting references occasionally, and that comes slightly later, um, about these Frankish ships that have got into conflict with the Portuguese, for instance. And we know from other East India Company records that those Frankish ships are English ships, for example, but England really, at this point, is really too small a fry for the Mughal Empire to worry about or even to acknowledge. And this is Rowe's problem. You know, he is a man who's been sent by his king, who has specifically, in his letter of instruction, told him, whatever else you do, make me look good and impressive to the Mughal Emperor, who is, we know, one of the richest emper emperors in the world. Um, but then he goes to this court where hardly anyone knows about his country, let alone his king. So he's got quite a big order to fulfil there. He does. You've got a great um, line where you, I think this is just plucked out of the records, probably um, 16th century, you'll tell me a bit more, but when they just talk about the wearers of hats, and that's about as far as their interest extends towards... I mean, and there's the Franks, which is almost resonant of the Crusades and an earlier period of history. But beyond that, it is it is really interesting, isn't it? You point out that Sir James Lancaster's 1591 voyage is this kind of disastrous precedent for what happens later. But that's the first big attempt, isn't it, for um, the English to go round the Cape towards the east. I'm not quite sure he goes to India, but he does go round the Cape at least and has... Um, uh, you know, some quite bad experiences afterwards. And so we're talking a generation afterwards where you've had the establishment of the East India Company, which is in response to European powers having their um, various um, companies and 
So this is really still very, very early on in, in the Anglo-Indian relationship, if, even if we could use that as a term. I don't know if we can. Yeah, I think there are references occasionally to Englishmen finding themselves in India. And those references start from around the late 1570s. But those are so few and fragmented. Um, there is very little sense of concerted effort there. Um so, for instance, at one point, I did a lot of work on this absolutely fascinating character, um, an English Catholic um, man called Thomas Stevens, who becomes a Jesuit priest. Um, and of course, you know, being a Jesuit priest is not particularly a healthy occupation in Elizabethan England. So he escapes to continental Europe, then finds his way to Portuguese Goa which is where he lives um, and dies, essentially, um, a few de decades later. Um, and Thomas Stevens, 50 years before John Milton, is the first Englishman to write an original epic, a poetic epic, based on the story of the Bible. But he writes it in an Indian language, Marathi. So there's figures like him. There are figures, um, a few merchants in 1583. Some of the people who will later set up the East India Company send an initial kind of, you could call it a scoping mission um, to India in 1583. Um, a man called Ralph Fitch and his um, kind of collaborators and um, investors can go to India. Fitch is the only person from that whole trip voyage to come back to England. And he publishes a record of that. But Till this point, there is very little sense of actual state-backed effort um, to have any kind of relationship between any of the powers in the subcontinent and England. Well, let's see what happens then. So let me begin by asking you this question we always ask of everyone who comes on, which is if you could travel back to any calendar year in the past, which one would take your fancy for the purposes of today at least? Oh, gosh. Um, that would have to be 1616. Mm, okay. So, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic year for multiple reasons. Lots of stuff happening in Europe around that same time, lots of scientific debates and arguments. Um, the Catholic Church starts cracking down on people like Galileo. So the world is moving already. Um, you know, those jigsaw pieces of what Europe thought of as its familiar world are being constantly shifted in this period. And But for me, that's the year when Thomas Rowe first presents himself as English ambassador at the Mughal court. So where had, uh, where had Roe got to? Say we're at the beginning of, um, before we go into the three scenes, I mean, we're, we're right at the start of um, 1616. There's all this stuff going on in England um, that you mentioned there, but we're we're panning away, we're, we're moving east, and we're finding Thomas Roe. Has, has he arrived in, in Surat by this point? Has he, um, he has. has he made much progress? How's it going? Not very well. For poor Roe, um, he arrives in Surat, which is the port that the English always went to in the, on the western coast of India. It's a, it's a smaller place now, not very familiar to um, English li listeners, perhaps, um, but it's near where Bombay will grow up or Mumbai will develop into this huge thriving city later on. So Rowe's ship, after this grueling over half a year of journey, arrives in Surat. Um, and then immediately and this is something any traveler will kind of sympathize with, he gets caught up in a customs wrangle about taxes, import taxes, and that goes on for ages. And on top of that, as again, every traveler will sympathize, the usual problems of getting used to the food, the, the kind of accommodation arrangements, catching a stomach bug that lies him low for, for a while. So He's struggling already by the point we get to him in 1616. And I think he must be suffering from quite a lot of cognitive dissonance because he has these two things going on in his head from my reading of your book, which is that one, he's a very important person because he's been given this very, very special job by the King of England to go and um, to foster diplomatic relations. But actually, he's not very important at all, as he discovers. And um, I thought it might be quite good just to 
at this point really explain just how vast, majestic, powerful the Mughal Empire was. I mean, we're talking about an empire of 100 million people, it covers a great um, sway the land of the powerhouse of the world. I mean, the one thing I always remember as, as our contemporary echo of this power is the word mogul is still used to ex to describe someone who's got a bit of, you know, a bit of clout and a bit of power. Is that right? That's, that's absolutely right. And this is precisely the period where that word develops that cultural weight as, you know, the word you choose to denote someone with superlative power and superlative amounts of wealth, essentially. The Mughals are tremendously wealthy. One thing to point out, however, is that they are still a fairly new dynasty in, in the subcontinent. Jahangir is the fourth Mughal emperor. His father had been exiled for ages at the Persian court and had then uh, uh, his grandfather, sorry, Jahangir is the fourth Mughal emperor. His grandfather had been exiled for ages, came back, established himself. It's Akbar, Jahangir's father, who was the first stable emperor. And Akbar, in terms of a timeline or identifiable timeline, perhaps, Jahangir is a direct contemporary of James I in that sense. So that helps us to situate these two figures. Both Jahangir and James are laboring under the shadow of someone who is even more striking and charismatic than they were as rulers. But having said that, when Ro arrives at the Mughal court, he is entering an enormously cultured and very, very nuanced in terms of its diplomatic and social hierarchies. Apart from that, what is really striking is the kind of intellectual environment that the Mughal court signified in this period. It's an absolute kind of hotbed of new thinking of various kinds, particularly in terms of literature and art and philosophical and religious thinking. Akbar Jahangir's father the great Mughal emperor um, had been deeply interested in comparative religions. Um, so there's, they have a degree of familiarity with Christianity, um, which comes mainly filtered through the Jesuits um, who were based in the West, in Goa, uh, under Portuguese regime. Um, but they're also really interested in Western innovations in art, particularly. And this becomes later a meeting point between Ro and Jahangir, their shared interest in artistic productions. And one thing that you mentioned just there bears stressing the word Portuguese. So the Portuguese at this point are the senior European players in this area. I know there's been a few skirmishes with the English in the years before, a couple of sea battles maybe. Um, so the English have, um, have managed to get a slight toehold, if that's the right way to put it. But the Portuguese can't be very pleased about the English turning up um, with Roe at all. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, the Portuguese had never been a, a kind of very pleased about English presence in India. In fact, when the first English voyage arrived in 1583 in Goa, um, the Englishmen were immediately put into prison um, by the Portuguese because one of the things that they didn't want the Mughals to realize was the break in the Christian church. It wouldn't do well at all for them to have these people wandering around, um, kind of announcing to everybody that the church wasn't a unified presence, that there was there were that it was essentially a split house between the Catholics and the Protestants. So the Portuguese are not too pleased at all about having the English there, particularly by the time when Roe gets there. He had already decided that the way for the English to establish a toehold in India would be to set themselves up as a rival maritime presence compared to the Portuguese. The Portuguese had a very well-developed system, essentially a protection racket called the Cartaz, which basically meant that you paid the Portuguese fleet a certain sum of money 
every year. And in return for that, they would agree not to attack and loot your ships. So they would be protecting you from themselves. Um, and Rose, one of Rose's endeavors throughout his embassy was to set up the English as a rival source of maritime protection. It's quite amusing in a, in a way to listen to um, you describe them keeping quiet the Reformation in time. <laughs> Really, it's quite quite a secret to have to keep from from the Mughal Empire. Okay, that's really good. And I think there's some there's some little snippets of Roe when he first arrives. When um, when when Roe really displays very clearly that he's a very quite neurotic, prickly character, and he doesn't like his dignity being uh, challenged in this way. And he really is put in his place. And there's um, the, the, there's quite a few amusing episodes. I won't go into that at the moment, but um, I think the picture of him that I just wanted to put into people's minds is is quite it's a it's a curious one if we think about global history of this you know this figure who has all of his own personal hang-ups that we discussed earlier being sent on this very curious mission and trying to <laughs> I suppose square a lot of circles which he just cannot and. If we bear that in mind, I think it will take us very nicely to the first scene that you want to uh, take us to. So uh, do you want to tell us where that is, what's happening, and what the attraction of it is, please? So if we travel back, we're travelling to the 10th of January, the afternoon, in fact, of the 10th of January, 1616. And we're in Ajmer, which is in the north of India, northwest of India. Um, you travel for a few weeks, if you were at the time traveling on camels or horses, away from Delhi and Agra towards the hilly, desert, dry regions of the what is now the current state of Rajasthan. And in between, you stop at this place, which is a thriving ancient city. Um, those who are familiar with India now will know it because of its proximity to a lake called Pushkar, where there had been an ancient fair from you know, kind of prehistoric times almost. But at that, this point, it is also a thriving city of Sufi um, mysticism, which is a part, an offshoot of Islamic um, mystic thinking and cultural kind of expression. Um, but it's also the place where, like his father Akbar, the Emperor Jahangir quite often wanted to retire to from his main kind of palaces in Agra, for instance, um, in order to spend time around that northern region for two reasons. One, because they loved this city, but secondly, in order to conveniently remind the kind of subsidiary kings of Rajasthan of Mughal presence. So there was a political and a kind of personal reason for that. We meet Ro in front of the great gate of the palace in Ajmer. And Ro already is in a really tricky position. There are multiple reasons for that. But the, the basic thing I think we've got to remember is that he's got a really complicated employment contract. And this matters. The seal on his appointment letter, if we can call it that, is of the king, of course, James I, who tells him, you know, whatever you do, make sure that the Mughal emperor knows that I'm a great king and deeply beloved by all my subjects. So there's that. But it's not James who's paying his salary. It's the East India Company, because James flat out refused to spend any money on this. He doesn't have any money to spare. So Roe is being bankrolled by the merchants at this point. So as he walks through that gate, it must have been deeply fraught and complicate, complicated for him to decide who is it that is taking those steps. Is it the employee of the trading company or is it the nominated representative of James I of England, 6th of Scotland? We're getting layers of complexity, aren't you, here? And let's talk a little bit, because I can feel Roe's dilemma. It's making me feel quite nervous all these years afterwards, but I, I can I can feel it. But it's made all the worse if you consider just what um, 
I mean, you, even from the name of the book, you have courting India. There's this idea of the theatricality of it and um, the nuance and the, the, the importance of spectacle performance, all of this. And right at the heart, um, the centre of the stage, if we were to follow the metaphor through, is Jahangir, the, the, who is thought of as the Mughal emperor by the English, at least that's the way we describe him. I mean, he's, he's a very rich character in in my reading of the book. He comes across in ways that we'll probably build on as we go through. But um, he is opposite to Roe, if we can think about it in those terms. And um, you, you describe as well that he's had more scholarship on him recently. He was seen as a bit of an in-between character for quite a lot of time by historians. But... Now people have come to look at him more squarely. They've found a very interesting character, haven't they? So do you want to tell us a little bit more about him and his personality, really? Yes, as you might have guessed from the book, I do have a bit of a soft spot for Jahangir, who I think has got um, the short shrift from historians in the past. And that's partly because he's sandwiched between two really interesting characters. Akbar the Great, his father, is just enormously interesting and pretty much the defining presence in terms of the history of the subcontinent um, in the earlier period. And then on the other side is his son, Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal. Um, I mean, you're in a tough spot sandwiched between those two, aren't you? But Jahangir is a fascinating person, I think. Fascinating and also slightly underestimated by both his contemporaries and by current historians, or till about a decade ago, I think. He fights with alcoholism throughout his life. He has this long, very stable relationship with his kind of crown empress, Nur Jahan, who wields huge amounts of influence at the court. He has a very fraught relationship with Prince Khurram, his crown prince, who will later become Shah Jahan, his son. And if you look at, even at kind of mid 20th century histories of the Mughal Empire, people tend to sidle up, up to Jahangir and then go, oh, he was, you know, weak and slightly effeminate and not particularly interesting. Let's just move on to Shah Jahan, who's much more interesting, or even better to Aurangzeb after that. But there's been a whole tranche of work fairly recently, over the last decade or so, which has begun, I think, to question that assumption. One of the things that reveals, for instance, is the stability of the Mughal Empire that Jahangir managed to establish. And the second is the really interesting ways in which he used what we might have discounted as just a spoiled rich emperor being drunk. So those matters of civility and hospitality and culture as real political tools in order to knit what was otherwise a really quite fractious political atmosphere together into something that was fairly stable and highly functional for a pretty significant reign, essentially, when the Mughal emperor, um, Empire flourished. So he's a fascinating mm. character. And he seems, uh, again, this is from my reading, and you'll tell me if it's correct or not, but he seems to have the authority that someone of his position needs. I mean, you've got the, uh, this is maybe apocryphal, I don't know, the, the the great story about someone breaking a China plate and them having to go to China, sending someone to China to fetch your number one back in to replace it. Um, I'm not sure if these are travellers' tales, but maybe they do convey a truth that his word had weight. He wasn't a weak ruler. Do you want to tell us what happened when he met, when he met Roe? His word certainly has weight. He is seen as both the king and a divine representative, essentially, on earth in some ways. When Ro arrives at the court, he takes with him an interpreter because Ro hasn't bothered to learn any Persian. Um, In fact, he doesn't throughout his embassy, despite the fact that this is a major obstacle for him. And Jahangir, from his perspective, doesn't really have a sense of this tiny island this person has come from, uh, bearing slightly ramshackle gifts. But he treats him with utter courtesy. So he greets him and Roe, in fact, writes in his 
journal that Jahangir doesn't wait for his inter- his dull interpreter, as Roe describes him, um, to actually pluck up enough courage to address the Mughal emperor. The emperor speaks first and welcomes him to the court and asks after the welfare of his brother, meaning James I. And this is, again, one of those little indications of global diplomacy in this period, the sense of the brotherhood of sovereignty that binds all monarchs, all kings and emperors together. That no matter which country you're a part of, if you are the ruler, then only another ruler understands both your responsibilities and your pain. So you're united, bonded by that shared experience, in a way. Um, So Jahangir greets him perfectly civilly, um, inquires after his health, because he had already heard that Roe had been down with dysentery, as many a traveler before him, offers to send him his own physician, which is a great sign of politeness and favor. And then Roe is gently kind of shepherded out. It's in and out within a few minutes. And his first audience is already over before he had fully appreciated what was happening in this court. To be fair to Jahangir, he had plenty of other things to do. So this is like, you know, having one person in a long list of court business that you have to tend to. It would be a wonderful thing to witness, though, wouldn't it? Because there's that slight sense of comedy that attends it. And of course, the great theatre and the majesty of the setting would be a wonderful thing to see. If anything, it makes clear to Roe that even if he thought it was going to be simple, it certainly is not going to be. So let's leave that one contained over here because we've got two more to move through. And um, the next of your, the second of your three scenes is where, please? The second scene is still in Ajmer. Um, this is a few months later. So we are now in on the 24th of May, 1616. Um, and we find ourselves in the private imperial chambers um, of the emperor Jahangir. And Roe has been summoned. And this is rather worry-making for Roe. He has been desperately trying to get into the inner circle. But this is not how he would have ideally wanted to do it. Because the reason for the summoning is, how shall I put it, essentially a spat between him and the crown prince of the Mughal emperor, Prince Khurram, about the fate, essentially, of a young runaway Englishman called Robert Jones. And the Mughal emperor, Jahangir, has taken it upon himself to sort this thing out between this foreign visiting dignitary and his son. I think it would be fair to describe this as a diplomatic incident, even if that's maybe um, slightly anachronistic. I'm not. I'm not sure, but yeah, it, it it is very interesting. Do you want to take this forward because this is a, a curious story? It's an anecdote that you dwell on um, when you're writing. I've got some more questions to ask you about it, but let's see how this plays out over the next few days. Sure. So the problem is that Robert Jones, this young man has decided to leave Roe's service. He had been recommended by one of Roe's closest friends when Roe first got his diplomatic position. But now he has decided that he did not want to carry on as part of the English retinue, and he was going to make his own way in India. Um, Roe writes in his journal that at first he clubbed up with some Italian, he says, and with a Mughal governor. And then, of course, Prince Khurram, who never really got on with Roe, somehow manages to find out about this whole business and decides to take this young man under his own employment at um, a salary that the English can't even pay Roe himself, let alone a coachman or a servant, essentially. So there's a huge argument between the two in front of the Mughal emperor at the end of which Khurram says, right, this Englishman obviously doesn't want to stay with you, so he's going to be my servant from now on. Ro has no way of resolving that. But then things get even more complicated because Jones obviously overnight worries about cutting all his ties with England. So he comes back to Ro, throws himself at his feet, Ro says, and pleads to be taken back. 
And now Roe has an even bigger problem. Because now, if he takes Jones back, it would be a direct challenge to the Crown Prince. It's quite a grave situation in a way, because I know um, maybe this is from later on, my knowledge anyway, but the, the East India Company were always very, very harsh on anyone they thought who, um, I suppose, absconded or left service. This is obviously... Um, uh, from a later period, but at this point, there's similar perils for Jones, aren't there? And he does seem to suffer for what he did. He does, not only because he left service, but also because of the way he got the Mughals involved. For Roe, what is particularly problematic is Prince Khurram's involvement, because Khurram is in charge of the trading ports where the English want their permits, in Surat, for instance. So it really does not bode well for English ambitions in India to antagonize this particular prince. Roe has been put in a position where he has no other option. What Roe is also really annoyed about is the sense of cultural assimilation. There's a power imbalance here between the two countries, between the two cultures, which is, I think, deeply counterintuitive to the way we might think about it in the sense that Roe is deeply conscious of the superior economic and social power that the Mughals wield and is deeply anxious of being assimilated within that nexus of power in some ways. And here he sees Robert Jones, this other Englishman, seemingly being absorbed by quite often what other English travellers describe as the hydra of Mughal imperial kind of um, power and ostentatious display. Um, so Roe clamps down pretty quickly on this, but he does it in a really complicated way and deeply, I think, in some ways, morally suspect way. So he pretends to forgive Robert Jones. He pretends that he has agreed to let Jones go. Jones says, well, you know, I won't stay here. I won't stay in, in India any further. Give me, just give me leave to take the next Portuguese ship back um, to Europe, and then I'll find my way to England on my own steam. Rose says yes to him, but then in private writes letters to his kind of agent in um, Western India at the ports of Western India and to someone else he had worked with before, a Dutch captain and tells them that the moment um, Joan steps onto the Dutch ship, which was just about to leave India to go back to Europe, he should be put under arrest, essentially, and delivered to the East India Company. And that's what happens to Jones. We know from the existing surviving East India Company records that he's imprisoned, he's put in the tower. There are two petitions from him that survive pleading for liberty, and then he disappears from the records. So we don't know what had happened to him in the end, but it is fairly certain that even at this very early stage, the East India Company really does not take internal infraction very kindly. It's a really fascinating vignette. And one thing that it leads me to ask you about really is it's about sources, because of course we have lots of people watching other people but another dynamic is that you're looking back, you're you're watching as well. And it's amazing that you have the ability to do so because you have source material that takes you right back to these moments. Um, I know that's on both sides, on the Mughal side and on the English side. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sources that you looked at when you were reconstructing moments like uh, like Jones's infractions or or whatever it would be? You know, Peter, I don't think I've ever been as happy about seeing paperwork <laughs> as I have been while writing this book. Thank goodness for the East India Company's absolute bureaucratic insistence on paperwork <laughs> all the time. Yeah. They loved things in duplicate and triplicate. So, for instance, Roe has to write a daily journal. And that is why we know exactly when he meets which person, including that first momentous meeting with the emperor, including that argument about Jones, the servant. 
but there are multiple other records from the East India Company merchants on the ground. What it does is it's kind of similar to those you know those old graphics novels or comics? I, I, I'm I showing my age here that we used to read when we were children. And you had those funny glasses with red and green lenses and you put them on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it came out in 3D. So that's what happens when you juxtapose the various textual sources. Yeah. Things just pop out because what is a gap in one source gets filled in by something else. So for instance... We know in Jones's case, Roe is really worried about the impression it creates in the Mughal court. He's really worried about this larger idea of Englishmen being seduced by Asian wealth. We don't quite know exactly what annoys him so much about Jones himself. But then if you look at the East India Company letters being exchanged by other people, including the agent in Surat, there's a fleeting reference where it says, ah, yes, that young man that um, the ambassador told us to look out for has been resorting with the notorious Sodomite, the Mughal governor of the region. So you suddenly get this picture that perhaps this is not simply a financial um, reason. There's possibility that there is an emotional or sexual kind of connection that Jones has developed in the country, which the English really don't like perhaps. So there are those little glimmers or fragments of lives that you suddenly get to see, which fills out this central kind of story that Roe tries to tell. And of course, his story is biased. He has a narrative that he needs to sell to both his employers. Mm. And there's two ways that you can confront this, isn't there? Because you can look at it as a scholar trying to establish the truth of what happened, which is obviously your central concern, but also as a storyteller, when you're constructing the narrative in your book, is what point of view do you take to tell a particular anecdote? Or do you state a point from one perspective and then restate it from another perspective? And then you have this state, counter state, counter state. It's quite it's quite a challenge, I think, in in creative writing. It's one that I find really interesting. And I'm sure given what you've just explained to me now, one that you've spent so much time thinking about, is how do you piece together these little um, fragments into something which both tells the story but carries the reader through? And I think that's a really... Um, this is one where I will send people to the book because it's it's really interesting to see how you do that construction work with, with historical writing because these are messy histories. Um, but they're really, really fun to, to I, I to think messiness over. is exactly the word to describe it. And that is very much the thing that I wanted to bring across, that the kind of historiographic work that we do is not a, a monolith. You know, there's a lot of debate and discourse, public debate and discourse, about what is true in history. But going simply by a textual document and what a textual document from the period asserts does not, does not necessarily indicate the truth because every textual document is a construct. It is something created by one person with an audience in mind. Um, and that's something that I keep trying to get back to in Rowe's story, in the story of this embassy. Um, and what fascinates me about it is what gets captured and what gets erased. So looking at those fragments allows me to accommodate some of those kind of little references to people, ordinary lives, which quite often get erased from this discussion of the wider kind of grand scale narratives of empire or cross-cultural encounter. I find this all so fascinating. Oh, goodness, I could talk to you about it all day. But um, if you don't mind, is it all right if we move on to the third of the three scenes? Because I think this is where things become, they do become more complex, but in a very revealing way in, in this third scene. And we've seen Roe going through the early phases of this very consequential embassy, trying to find his position, trying to establish a, a sense of self and a new place, I suppose. There's lots of great bits. I, I can't like kind of not mention the carriage and the musical instruments that he brings along to try and um, to, to try and give us presents, which are, I suppose, treated with a lot of indifference at the court because they've got better 
better things well, than that. Well, also, they fall <laughs> apart. I mean, the thing they that the English don't take into account is that a six-month sea voyage, popping things in the hold of a leaky ship is not the best way to transport things. The carriage and the musical organ just falls apart and has to be kind of glued back together. But what it did do for me is take me into something which is maybe a bit geeky, but I enjoyed, which is the history of coaches. And I I didn't really know when coaches, because 1560 they started appearing in Elizabethan Sea. So I've learned things, which I'm (laughs) grateful to you for. But let's go to the the third of the, the three. So the final scene, which does tell us something new and I think is a lovely way to cap off the year. So we are now at the end of this really momentous year in the embassy. And this is before Christmas, it's 18th of December, 1616, and we are no longer in Ajmer. Jahangir had decided by this point that he wanted to travel, as he quite often did. Um, He was notoriously fond of traveling, going on these elaborate imperial progresses, as indeed Elizabeth I did in England. So this wouldn't have been anything unfamiliar to Rome, this habit of monarchs deciding they wanted to go on a jolly and expecting everyone else to follow, essentially. What he wasn't expecting was the scale of the operation. This was basically, if you imagine, moving a city of about 60,000 people every day over a period of five months across all kinds of terrain. So at this point, Roe is scrabbling on the kind of te- coattails of the imperial lashkar, the imperial procession, across Rajasthan. And we catch them at a moment when the lashkar has set up camp in the evening. And Ro gets to see Jahangir talking to an ordinary traveling hermit. Jahangir, and this is another thing to perhaps keep in mind, which is really surprising to Ro, coming from Protestant England, at this particular moment of European religious wars, Jahangir rules over an empire which has multiple religions. He himself follows Islam and he is deeply pious, but he is the son of a Rajput princess who had been married by his father Akbar as a part of a dynastic kind of move to incorporate other kingdoms within his own empire. And right from that period, the previous period onwards, the Mughal emperor has always encouraged political and religious dialogue. That doesn't mean that, you know, it was all hunky-dory and everyone was equal. Of course, there was differences and taxation and practical measures on um, the Muslim subjects and the Hindu or Jain subjects of the Indian subcontinent under Mughal rule. But it did mean that India in this period harbored a degree of religious dialogue that would be inconceivable in Protestant England, for instance. So there's a moment in Rowe's diary, his daily journal, where he talks about seeing, going to see the Mughal emperor in his traveling court, in his traveling darbar, seeing him sit next to this, what he says, a dusty fellow in rags. So this is um, a hermit, a sadhu, um, from some Indian um, Hindu kind of sect, perhaps. We are not entirely clear who it is. There might be a few possibilities. But from Rose's perspective, what he sees is the richest man in the world sitting there very patiently listening to this person, talking to him in a kind of combination of multiple languages that they share snatches of. And then Rose says, to his surprise, this man digs out this half-baked roti, Indian flatbread, that he himself had made and gives it to the Mughal emperor as a gift. You know, here's a piece of bread I've brought for you. Imagine the irony of that. This is a man who only drinks out of single jade goblets. And Jahangir accepts it. He breaks the bread in two, shares it with the hermit. And then when it's time for the hermit to leave, the hermit decides, right, I've had enough of talking to emperors. He wants to leave. Jahangir helps him up. And Ro says, you know, without any concern for his fine clothes or jewels, he embraces the hermit and then sends him on his way with some money and arms of various kinds. 
And Roe, you can see from his journal, he's deeply conflicted about how to feel about this particular encounter. He says this would not be amiss in a pious Christian. And then fleetingly, you know, a few moments later, he says, I wish pious Christians would behave like this. And then immediately moves away from it into this long string of grievances about Mughal politics, as if to rebalance that those scales. For his later editors in the 17th century, when this journal gets absorbed into print, um, again, we see a sense where English editors and readers feel that they need to balance this out. So there's a little marginal editorial note saying, you know, some something on the lines of, this is very pious, but in the wrong religion, it is all sin and to be ignored. So there's a really complex dynamics of cross-cultural encounter and how to cope with the kind of radical rejigging of your worldview that is imposing mm. on Rome at this moment. You can definitely sense Rose's worldview being challenged. It almost has shades of, I suppose, the Good Samaritan or something like that. I mean, that's to me how that piece of source material struck me because it is, because it's um, contained within that early 17th century English language. It's all the more um, fun to read. But I think one thing as a thread which runs through your book um, is this sense, and this is probably where we get the real global history, is a sense of comparison, which you're, you're doing. I mean, you did it earlier on when you were saying that um, Behind Gear is, is equivalent to James I in his chronological reign. Um, but also looking to see how Roe is constructing his understanding of the Mughal court and politics through what's actually happening in this conspiratorial context back in Whitehall. He's seeing all of these things. And then I know there's a point you you make about James when he comes, comes south from Scotland to claim the, the English throne. And I think he has someone executed on the way and it causes a bit of um, a flutter of disquiet, shall we say. Um, because he really is acting the absolute monarch, and people are saying, "Well, why do we, why don't we bother having any trials if we're just going to execute people at a whim?" Um, and to put Rose surely knew about that because that was a talking point at court in in London. But to compare that to this behaviour is going to challenge anyone, isn't it? Is that right? You're absolutely right, and I think one of the things that I try to do in the book is question really that division which drives some of our historical understanding. So conventionally, um, in our received history, we think of English encounters with elsewheres, and those elsewheres may be in North America, or in South Asia, or in the Middle East, as something that takes place over there, and has very little relationship beyond the direct ones about trading companies or movements of people with what's going on at home in England. But the thing that fascinates me about this particular embassy is how clearly it shows little resonances and echoes of memory being triggered for Roe, which then impact on his perception of this new statecraft, this new political structure that he's encountering. So going back to that issue of tyranny, for instance, Roe cuts his political teeth as a member of parliament in one of James I's most contentious parliamentary kind of experiences, which was called the adult parliament, the confused parliament, precisely because it didn't resolve anything. And it was a huge, fairly portentous blow up in terms of the wrestling of power between the House of Commons and the monarch. Um, James wanted to impose more taxes. The House of Commons was resisting it. Um, so there's a great degree of anxiety in this period within England about tyranny, about who holds political power, about the moral and ethical status of the monarchy itself. Um, James is unlucky in the sense that he comes after a very long reign of um, a surprisingly popular queen. Elizabeth I pretty much, you know, has been the queen for the living memory of multiple generations by this point. And then James, whom many of his English subjects cannot understand, 
who has very strong idiosyncratic views about various things from tobacco to witchcraft comes to the throne. And there's a deep degree of anxiety within English politics about him, about his family, about the kind of scandals that surround this new monarchy. And all of that um, are bits of memorial baggage that Thomas Rowe packs with him as he sets off on his voyage to India. He unloads that baggage as easily as he unloads the, you know, the ramshackle organ and carriage that he's going to give to the Mughal emperor. Mm-hmm. And your fascination with this history that you talk about really is there present in the book. It's really alive with the sense of you working in the archives, which is one of the things that I think I'll take from it because it's that that great conversation, you know, you get when you're reading works like this of you interacting with the source material, trying to make sense of it and drawing in these these broader points. One of them that just struck me as you were talking then is uh, one thing we could learn from the 17th century is giving names to parliaments. Why do we not do that anymore? We should They, we, they always used to do that. What would we call today's par- the deranged parliament, maybe, or something that's destructive? <laughs> anyway, we could maybe learn a few things from the past. Um, I've got um, a final question to put to you before I let you go. And it's um, hopefully a fun one, and you'll have lots of opportunity because there was lots of things in the Mughal Empire that might catch your eye as you were wandering around. Is there a tangible object that you would like um, as a memento of this conversation or of the year 1616? have maybe in that nice office I can see behind you? <laughs> you mean uh, something that I would lift while I was yeah. unnoticed as I was traipsing a, across a behind row? Yeah, whilst Rose worrying about diplomatic incidents and um, maybe whilst uh, Yangir is having his bit of burnt roti or something like that, maybe. I know just the thing. And it's a convenient one as well. I, you know, I was momentarily tempted by the carriage, but that would be very difficult to pro- pocket, I think. But the thing <laughs> that I would have my eyes on is very pocketable. It's a little miniature portrait. So there's a story, and this actually is at the heart of the book itself. There's a story of a bet between Ro and Jahangir, which circles around a little English miniature that Roe carries with him. And here's the thing. The English are deeply conscious that they're, you know, about a century belated when it comes to this whole idea of the European Renaissance. Their fashion is a mixture of all kinds of European fashion. Their music is a mixture of all kinds of European stuff. But the thing that they really do well beyond any other competitor in Europe is miniature portraits. That is where they're the leaders of the field. And Roe takes with him multiple of these miniatures, but there's one particular one that he is deeply kind of um, possessive of. Um, But he knows that the emperor Jahangir loves art, so he shows him this miniature. Um, And Jahangir wants wants it, as emperors do, as powerful people do. The idea that someone will say no to him does not really occur to him. So he wants it, and Roe says, not this one. Sorry, I can. There are other things that I've got back at home. If you want, I can bring them over, but not this particular one. It's the image of someone I had loved who is no longer. So Jahangir has this bet with him where he says, Well, tell you what, I'll get my best portrait artist. He's going to copy this miniature, make multiple copies of it. We'll show them to you. And if you can recognize your one, you can have it back. And if not, I'll still give it back to you but you'll have to give my artist a prize of recognition. We don't know which miniature it was. You know, there are numerous uh, miniatures of the early 1600s that survive beautifully fine brushed um, evocations of people's faces, of costume and jewelry. I'd be fascinated if we could figure out which one it was. And if I was there following Roe, thanks to your time traveling, that's the one I'd pick up. In fact, I'd probably pick up all five of them. 
Yeah. Well, we could stretch to five, maybe. You could have them arranged. But the good thing about them is they wouldn't just have to hang on the wall or a carriage could go in the, in the garage, but you you could have them on the desk to flick open at moments <laughs> of uh, when you required a bit of inspiration. Um, loads to think about. That's a great object, really good one, and a uh, wonderful story that's attached to it. Thank you very much for taking the time to tell us all about Courting India, which is going to be out next week. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.